This is the largest and most magnificent palace complex in China and even the world. This was the political center of China from the 15th century to the earliest 20th century. These courtyards with their scarlet walls and yellow roof tiles witness the final struggles of China's 2,000 year old feudal society. In the past, the Forbidden City was a symphony of architecture, but today it is more a symbol of culture and history. In 1406, 38 years after the overthrow of the Mongolian Yuan dynasty, Emperor Yongle of the Ming dynasty moved the capital from Nanjing to Beijing. He quickly had the magnificent Yuan Palace demolished so he could use the space to build his new palace. The new palace was like another foundation for the Ming dynasty. It made the new capital a fortress against the remaining Yuan forces outside the Great Wall. In the sixth month of 1406, Emperor Yongle ordered construction on his palace to begin immediately. A general director named Chen Gui was put in charge of the project. Timber and other building materials were sourced from all over the country. The emperor wanted to use all available resources to make the most magnificent palace under heaven. For the next 10 years, Beijing was the site of the largest and most active construction site in China. This is the construction in progress. Beijing has many places names derived from those workshops and warehouses. A large team of workers and machinery arrived at the Forbidden City in 2002 to carry out a large-scale renovation. It took Emperor Yongle 18 years to complete his project, but the current overall should take 19 years. This was no ordinary renovation. Traditional technologies from the time of the original construction had to be used throughout the project.
though we cannot actually see how these buildings were built. The technologies, just like these magnificent halls themselves, survive to this day. Construction technologies in the Qing Dynasty were divided into major categories, including carpentry, plastering, masonry, bundling, earthwork, painting, color drawing, and paper hanging. This magnificent complex is called the Forbidden City today. It featured all the building techniques for royal palaces from previous generations. It covers an area 750 meters by 960 meters, a total of 720,000 square meters. Structures occupy 150,000 of that area. It has been said there are 9,999 and a half rooms, but a survey conducted in 1973 found only 8,704 remaining. Weathering and disasters claimed the rest. In ancient China, nine was considered the largest number. For this reason, the structure of every building in the Forbidden City is somehow related to the number nine. The gates have nine horizontal and nine vertical lines of doornails, and the roofs have nine legendary beasts. Each of the four corner towers on the outer wall has nine roof beams, 18 pillars, and 72 ridges. The word for nine in Chinese sounds the same as the word for eternal, so the emperors hoped that the use of the number nine could ensure their long rule. The Meridian Gate, the largest in the Forbidden City, was the site of major ceremonies and holiday celebrations. Such activities demonstrated the supreme power of the Emperor. You can only get a true feeling of the Forbidden City once you are inside the gate. This square divides the Forbidden City into the inner part to the north, where the Imperial family lived, and the outer part to the south, where government affairs were conducted. Ceremonies were held in the outer part of the Forbidden City, where the Hall of Supreme Harmony the Hall of Central Harmony and the Hall of Preserving Harmony were located. The Hall of Supreme Harmony was commonly known as the Hall of Golden Bells. It is the tallest and largest of all the halls. Its length to width ratio is 9 to 5, reflecting the supremacy of the Emperor.
This was the venue for all significant ceremonies during the Ming and Qing dynasties, including coronations, imperial weddings, awarding titles of nobility, naming military officers, and seeing off the army. This hall was probably the least decorative in the Forbidden City, since it only contained the Emperor's throne. From his throne, the Emperor could radiate his power to every corner of the city. Behind the Hall of Supreme Harmony is the Hall of Central Harmony, a place for the Emperor to rest. Each time he attended a ceremony, the Emperor would rest for a while in this place to receive respect from his ministers. Every year on Chinese New Year's Eve, the Emperor would hold a dinner party here for the ministers and lords of minority ethnic groups. Later this place was also used for the Emperor to personally test the successful candidates of the royal examinations, which were the final royal examinations to decide the top three placeholders. This royal examination differed from previous ones. The Emperor himself was the examiner. This answer sheet, neatly done in regular Chinese script, was written by a candidate during the reign of Emperor Qianlong to answer a question from the Emperor. The time to hand in the sheets was sunset on the same day. This is the list of successful candidates in the last imperial examination to be presided over by the Emperor ever held in Chinese history. 273 names are on it. It was a huge honor to have one's name on the list, not only for the candidate, but even more for his family. Beyond the gate of heavenly purity was the place for the emperor's family. Before the time of Emperor Kangxi, this place was the living room for the Emperor. After Emperor Yung Zhong moved his living quarters to the Hall of Mental Cultivation, this place became the Emperor's office and a place for dinner parties. Behind this wooden plaque, inscribed with four Chinese characters, meaning justice and honor, was a small locked wooden box kept in secret. It would hold the name of the prince that the emperor had chosen to succeed him. This place was for the Empress during the Ming Dynasty. Emperor Shen Zhi changed it in 1665 into a shamanist house of worship. Inside on the west and north sides were the shrines. A huge cooking pot placed on the northeast corner was for preparing meat for use in worship. The eastern chamber of the palace 
was the nuptial chamber when the emperor got married. During the time of Emperor Kangxi, the empress was designated to live inside the palace of earthly tranquility. It was a palace in the middle of the six eastern and six western palaces. This was a sign that the empress commanded the other women in the royal family. Because of the position of this palace, the empress was also called the core of the royal family. The emperor's other women lived in the palaces around it, commonly called the six eastern and six western palaces. The layout of the six eastern and six western palaces came from the ancient book Rites of Zhou. Because these palaces were lived in by the emperor's concubines, they are arranged in a sign forming the Kun diagram, representing Yin from the Yin and Yang theory. The status of these palaces was lower than the three rear palaces. Between the Palace of Heavenly Purity and the Palace of Earthly Tranquility is the Hall of Union, a place to keep the 25 imperial seals that the Qing emperors used. Why 25? This was determined by Emperor Qianlong following the description in another ancient book, the Book of Changes, describing the 25 changes that heaven might have. It was also his hope to be blessed by heaven so that his empire would last at least 25 generations. According to the Chinese feng shui theory, the place where a man lives should have a mountain, a pond, trees and flowers. Following this theory, every part of this imperial garden has a fascinating view. This garden combines both the royal and private garden style from China's south, a marvelous work of art amid solemn looking halls. Chinese New Year 1421, 62-year-old Emperor Yongle received greetings from his ministers in this newly completed hall. This was the most glorious moment in his life. Forbidden City is more than an architectural complex. It was the embodiment of the philosophy of feudal China that the state and the royal family are one. Emperor Yang Le made the Forbidden City a miniature of his own kingdom, the symbol of the political system that dominated China for more than 2,000 years. repeated modeling and remodeling over the 500 years that ensued, the Forbidden City became the largest palatial complex in the world. The ultimate example of Chinese architecture, the bear of Chinese culture, an epitome of its history. For 600 years after it was completed, this huge courtyard was China's center of power. Every morning before daybreak, officials were seen entering the Forbidden City via the Golden Water Bridge under the gate of accepting heavenly mandate. 
those living fairly far away, had risen at midnight. By three o'clock, they had to show up at the Meridian Gate and wait to be summoned. Every day began like this, with the ministers summoned to court to meet with the emperor and to receive instructions. During the Ming Dynasty, there was a standardized administrative workflow at court. Memorials to the throne and suggestions from even the common people were gathered by the Department of Administration and submitted to the Emperor by the Directorate of Ceremonies. Then they were presented to the Grand Secretariat for suggested solutions before being returned to the Directorate of Ceremonies to get the Emperor's approval. The edict from the Emperor would then be issued by the six administrative sections and after covering 143.7 thousand kilometers distance and passing 1,936 posts set up across the country would reach every corner of the country. The Qing Dynasty had a slightly different workflow and arrangement of governmental departments. In 1729, the Grand Council was set up to replace the ministers' meeting that were held before the throne, an old practice dating from the time before the Manchu rulers took over the country. On the northwest side of the square by the Gate of Heavenly Purity was a row of inconspicuous one-story rooms. They were the offices of the Grand Council. The Grand Council's offices were only 50 meters away from the Hall of Mental Cultivation, the place where the Qing Emperors did their daily administration. Qing Emperors would read memorials from officials in this hall also in this place, the Grand Minister would listen to the Emperor's oral instructions before he returned to the Grand Council office to put them in written form. Then he would come back with the result for the Emperor's approval. If he got it, the Imperial Edict would be issued by the Grand Council. Emperor Yongle never expected that on a stormy night three months after the Forbidden City was completed, three of its halls would be struck by lightning and burned to the ground. Ever since that moment, this magnificent and enormous palatial complex seemed to undergo alternating construction efforts and random forces of destruction. Emperor Kangxi finally made up his mind in 1695 to rebuild the three halls destroyed by lightning 16 years earlier. He wanted to regain the glory they had enjoyed during the Ming. Nobody could picture these magnificent halls built over 200 years before. No blueprints, no written documents, nothing was available to assist in the rebuilding efforts. A man named Liang Jiu solved this insurmountable difficulty. He made a wooden model of the Hall of Supreme Harmony at a scale of 10 to 1 and then used it to finish the main structure. being made in their proper size, 
every one of the intricate wooden parts fit perfectly into place. In 1697, after two years of hard work, the rebuilding project was completed. The original look of the Forbidden City was restored to its former glory. Emperor Kangxi made this happen. When it came to the rebuilding or remodeling of the Forbidden City, Emperor Qianlong definitely made a greater contribution than anyone else. He undertook the largest rebuilding project since the Forbidden City was completed in 1420. Two of the more fundamental changes were made to facilitate modifications to the political system. Emperor Qianlong used to live in this mansion as a crown prince. He later decided that he wanted to elevate this place to the status of a hall. So after rebuilding and remodeling, this three courtyard compound became the palace of many splendors. The second major part of this project was the rebuilding of the Palace of Tranquil Longevity. Not long after he became the emperor, Qianlong made a vow not to stay in power longer than his grandfather, Emperor Kang Shihad, who ruled for 61 years. On the 8th anniversary of his enthronement, Emperor Qianlong announced that he would pass the throne on to his own son. In 1771, Emperor Qianlong instructed for the rebuilding of the Palace of Tranquil Longevity for his retirement. Even after he gave up the throne, he still held power from the Hall of Mental Cultivation until 1799, when he died at the age of 89. He never stayed inside the Palace of Tranquil Longevity, a palace that had cost a fortune to rebuild, not for a single day. The revolution of 1911 ended the system of feudalistic monarchy that had lasted for more than 2,000 years. The grand performance of the dynasties at this magnificent palace drew to an end. On February 12, 1912, the last meeting was held inside the Hall of Mental Cultivation. Empress Dowager Long Yu and Pu Yi the six-year-old last emperor of China promulgated the imperial edict of abdication. China's feudal dynastic history ended forever. The downfall of the Qing dynasty marked the end of several thousand years of feudal society. The Forbidden City was no longer forbidden to ordinary people, no longer the ruling place and living quarters of the emperors. It became a symbol of Chinese history and culture. From that time, the crimson gates of this palace, which had veiled a mysterious world for 600 years, were thrown wide open to welcome all. In accordance with the decision of the Temporary Governing Committee, 
On November the 15th, 1924, the abdicated Emperor Puyi was expelled from the Forbidden City by the troops of warlord Fang Yuxiang. The emperor left behind a tremendous amount of valuable items. The following year, on October the 10th, the Palace Museum was founded, ending its history as a royal residence. With that, a world-class museum was born. On June the 26th, 1923, the Palace of Established Happiness had suddenly caught fire. At the time, many people wondered about just who caused this mysterious fire and the fate of the many treasures in the Forbidden City. There were rumours that the eunuchs on guard were smuggling treasures out of the Forbidden City to sell in Liu Lichang, the famous Beijing antique market. Some people were certain that the eunuchs set the fire to destroy the records of the things they had stolen. Pui ordered an investigation, but it led nowhere. Eighteen days after the fire, all the eunuchs were expelled from the Forbidden City, leaving behind the imperial treasures collected over the centuries. Ever since the reign of Emperor Qianlong, all the imperial treasures were kept in the Palace of Established Happiness. When Emperor Jia Qing ascended the throne, he had the treasures sealed in large cases and locked up in this palace. No one dared to touch them until, that is, Puyi opened them 100 years later. This rather ordinary looking cup is as old as the palace itself. On the bottom it bears characters which mean made in the reign of Emperor Yong Le. This is the first example of a dating practice that was followed from then on in the Ming and Qing porcelain kilns. The cup's pale blue colour with faint rust-coloured spots was created by the addition of smalt, a rare and expensive cobalt mineral that Zheng He, the legendary Chinese adventurer, brought back from Arabia. Emperor Yong Le took great pleasure in adorning the interior of this palace with treasures. Yong Le blue and white porcelain is one of the most valuable types of Chinese porcelain.
All of this type of blue and white porcelain came from the famous imperial Jingde Jian. This town gained a reputation for making fine blue and white porcelain in the Yuan Dynasty. During the Ming and Qing dynasties, China's porcelain became more colorful. The kilns of Jingde Jian have been operating for over 500 years, sending countless masterpieces to the Forbidden City. The reign of Emperor Qianlong marked a high point in the manufacture of porcelain. This large vase is a good example of the fine craftsmanship of the period. It is decorated with 15 glazed colors, 16 emblazonries, and 12 auspicious images. It is known as the mother of porcelain. Many of the 350,000 porcelain objects now in the Palace Museum came from official Ming and Qing kilns. In addition to fine contemporary porcelain works, Ming and Qing emperors also collected porcelain made by the five best-known kilns of the Song Dynasty, Kilns that operated a thousand years ago. These unique and exotic patterns were created by the high temperatures in the Song Dynasty Juin Kiln. These high temperatures cause the colors to flow. The phenomenon is known as kiln change. Each color had a poetic name, but the most precious color of them all was red. Porcelain from the Ru kiln is distinguished by its pale green color and simple but elegant shape. Its elegance and simplicity represented another high point in Chinese porcelain manufacture. Extant porcelain from the Ru kiln is the rarest of porcelain from the five main Sung kilns. There are no more than 100 pieces extant worldwide, and 20 of them are in the Forbidden City. These small fine crackles on the surface are typical of porcelain from the Ge kiln. They were caused by the different way the glaze and porcelain reacted to the drastic change in temperature that occurred as the piece was removed from the kiln. These fine decorative crackles are only seen in porcelain from the Ge kiln. Porcelain from the official kiln was usually pale grey with simple shapes. The colour was said to come from agate after firing. Its surface was fine, smooth and shiny like jade. The Ding kiln, named after the town of Ding in Hebei province, made porcelain that was usually pure white in colour. In addition to the Jing De Jian porcelain makers, the Ming and Qing set up organizations to supply the imperial family with other daily necessities. One of these was the Imperial Household Department, founded in 1662 during the Qing Dynasty.
The Imperial Household Department was responsible for supplying everything, including porcelain, furniture, jade, cloisonné and paintings, as well as gold and silver utensils for daily use. This chair is the only one of its kind in the world. The main part was made from antlers of deer killed by Emperor Kangxi. It is just one of the masterpieces made by the Imperial Household Department. This chair has been called the first chair of the Chinese nation. It is made of red sandalwood and it is inside the Hall of Supreme Harmony. Emperors sat on this chair to read, write and make decisions. The chair, desk, finely carved bed, footstools, tables and everything else used by the Emperor were made of the best materials with the finest craftsmanship in the country. Everything had to be fit for an emperor and his court. Ming Dynasty furniture featured a variety of lines in a single piece, including flat, concave, convex, protruding and intruding lines to form thousands of highly decorative shapes. Qing Dynasty furniture reflects a mixture of Manchu and Han culture. The form and workmanship are particularly emphasized and the pieces often feature decorative carving, inlay and painting. Auspicious symbols are frequently part of the decoration. No one knows precisely how many pieces of furniture there are inside the 9,000 rooms of the Forbidden City, as the Palace Museum now has thousands of pieces of furniture in its collection. In addition to furniture made by the Imperial Household Department, master craftsmen from Guangzhou, Suzhou and Shanxi also made furniture for the Imperial Court. This enormous jade carving depicts Da Yu subduing a flood. It weighs over five tons, making it the largest and heaviest jade carving among the 30,000 in the Forbidden City. People call it the King of Jade, and there's a story behind it. In the Kunlun mountain range in Xinjiang, there's a 5,000 meter high mountain capped with snow throughout the year. This mountain was famous for its nephrite, known locally as Hotan Jade. People went up the mountain to mine the jade from July through to September. Nephrite is a soft, white and smooth type of stone. Streams formed by melting snow often carry small pieces of jade into the river, eventually becoming smooth jade stones, the finest type of Hotan jade. These stones were known as jade pebbles. One day in the summer of the year 1760, a five-ton jade boulder was discovered on the mountain, but moving it to Beijing required taking it down the mountain 
and then moving it to Beijing via thousands of kilometers of rough and narrow road. To solve the problem, the workers first poured water on the road to make it slick. The jade was then loaded onto a wooden cart 11 meters long, which was pulled by a hundred horses in front and pushed by a thousand men behind. Even with such a massive force, however, they could only cover 10 kilometers a day. Transporting the jade boulder from the mountain in Xinjiang to the Forbidden City took three years. When Emperor Qianlong finally saw the jade, he was overjoyed. He instructed the Imperial Household Department to create a carving that would be a copy of a Song Dynasty painting depicting Da Yu subduing the floods. First, a preliminary carving plan was drawn up, after which Qianlong ordered the jade to be shipped to Yangzhou, where the best jade carvers worked. It took 10 years, several hundred thousand men, a huge sum of money, and a team of carvers to turn this gigantic piece of jade into a piece of art in the Hall of Joyful Longevity. Emperor Qianlong had a few words inscribed on the work, dedicating it to a ruler who worked hard for the people. Many of the 9,000 rooms inside the Forbidden City were fancy and comfortable, but Emperor Qianlong preferred this six square meter chamber. Here, he often spent time reading and writing, and of course, enjoying his antiques, calligraphy, and paintings. Quality is more important than size, and in this small space, Chan Long displayed his three favorite calligraphy works from Chinese history. For this reason, the room was also called the Hall of the Three Rarities. Qianlong could never have imagined that 100 years later, these three treasures would be involved in a major drama of loss and return. In the early 20th century, the Qing dynasty came to an end and the forbidden city was thrown into chaos. A concubine named Consort Jean secreted two of the treasures in her chambers in the Palace of Longevity and Health. She then smuggled them out of the palace in her luggage.
the two stolen works ended up in Hong Kong. In 1951, the Chinese government paid a high price to bring them back to the Palace Museum. This third work ended up in Taiwan in 1949. It is now in the collection of the Palace Museum in Taipei. But the most dramatic event involved the famous Song Dynasty painting along the river during Qingming Festival. This work was created between the year 1100 and 1125 by court artist Zhang Ziduan. The first collector of this famous painting was the Song Emperor Huizong. In 1127, it fell into the hands of the Jin Dynasty after the fall of the Song capital Kaifeng. When the Mongols conquered the Jin Dynasty and founded the Yuan Dynasty, they brought the painting back. Then in 1351, an art restorer smuggled it out of the palace, leaving in its place a fake. When the Ming Dynasty replaced the Yuan Dynasty, the painting fell into the hands of Yan Song, a powerful Ming Dynasty official. When Yan Song then fell out of favor with the court, the painting was confiscated. Next, a high-ranking eunuch named Feng Bao allegedly smuggled it out of the palace again. The painting's last private owner was a Qing official by the name of Bi Yuan. After Bi Yuan's death, his house was searched in connection with a malfeasance investigation. The painting was found and returned to the court. Unfortunately, by that time, Emperor Qianlong had died, so he could no longer enjoy this cherished painting. But this was not the end of the story. Pu Yi, China's last emperor, gave the painting to his younger brother Pu Jie to take out of the Forbidden City for him to collect later. After Pu Yi was expelled from the Forbidden City, he took the painting to Tianjin and later to Changchun. In 1945, the puppet regime of Manchu Kuo collapsed and the painting was sent to the Liaoning Provincial Museum. In 1953, it was finally returned to the Palace Museum. Between 1756 and 1762, Emperor Qianlong twice put down a Zunga rebellion, one of his ten greatest military victories. The emperor commissioned foreign painters to commemorate the event, and then he had it sent to France to be made into copper plates. It took seven French engravers seven years to finish the job. Finally, in the year 1774, the 200 prints, the original painting, and the copper plates were shipped back to China 11 years after the project began.
Emperor Qianlong was interested in more than painting and calligraphy. He also compiled two books about the 1,529 bronzes in his collection. Da Yu, a ruler in ancient China who subdued the floods, allegedly had nine bronzes made as a symbol of the unification of all the tribes. Ceremonial bronze items were popular during the Xia, Shang, and Zhou dynasties, and the following dynasties followed their example. By the time of Emperor Qianlong, bronze culture had long been in decline, but the emperor liked to collect bronzes as a symbol of his political ideals. To the emperors, bronzes symbolized an ideal society. The Palace Museum has an incredible 15,000 bronzes in its collection, 10 times as many as in Qianlong's collection. Over 1,600 of them bear inscriptions. This magnificent bronze is now in the Palace Museum in Taipei. Emperor Qianlong never saw it. In 1799, just three years after he retired, Emperor Qianlong passed away. As Qianlong faced death at the age of 89, the glory of the Qing Empire was also slowly dying. Qianlong's son, who succeeded the throne, had all his father's precious collections packed away in boxes and he had them hidden in a safe place. It wasn't until 100 years later in 1922 that the boxes were found. Much has happened in the five centuries since the Forbidden City was built. In that time, countless emperors, government ministers, poets and artists have left their mark on the palace. Among other things, the Forbidden City served as the center of an empire, a military headquarters and a storeroom for treasure. But that is now all history. Everything is gone except for the thick red walls, the magnificent palaces, and the paving bricks worn down by so many footsteps. If they could talk, they would tell us about the former glory of the Forbidden City.